you have to know the side effects if you want to be successful with intermittent fasting. I say this with just my own experience in mind because if you go into it with unrealistic expectations, you set yourself up for failure. If you know the fasting side effects, you can overlook all the gobbledygook and you can get through with your fasting and you can have the success, you can have the weight loss, and you can have the potentially even muscle building effects and everything can be successful. I always say with education comes adherence and that's the good stuff and the bad stuff. So to break it down, I'm also going to give you solutions. So please stick with me through this entire video. Don't skip ahead because there's gonna be lots of good stuff. So try to stick with me on it and I'll make it very, very simple for you. I also would like to ask if you please hit that red subscribe button so you can just know whenever I'm posting new videos and stuff like that and just never miss a beat. I've got new videos almost every single day at 7.30 a.m. Pacific time. All right, I don't wanna waste your time. Let's go ahead and get right into this. The first one that you've probably experienced before is the good old fashioned fasting headache, okay? If I could describe the fasting headache, it's in the frontal portion of your head and it's just kind of a low grade, just, just kind of just there, right? Okay, it's not this pulsating one. It's not like the throbbing, vroom, vroom, vroom type of headache. It's, a, it's just a kind of a nagging one. Now, what ends up going on is reductions in blood glucose to some degree end up altering pain receptors in our brain a little bit. So what that means is that we end up having sort of this misconstrued signal in our brain that makes us feel a little bit of pain that isn't really there. We're not necessarily getting it from massive amounts of blood flow or anything like that. It's just blood glucose changing. It's not a hypoglycemia issue. People think when they're fasting, their blood sugar is getting low and that's why they're getting headaches. Usually low blood sugar doesn't really come into play with fasting. And the reason is, is because you have enough peripheral insulin resistance where your cells in your body, not your brain, but your body, sort of turn off the need for glucose to reallocate glucose to the brain. So what that means is your brain is usually getting enough glucose. It's usually just a small drop and it's at a nice even drop. If normally you're here and you're just slightly sitting here, it's just altering those pain receptors ever so slightly. The other piece is dehydration. Okay, that of course is gonna give you a headache and that's the same kind of, kind of headache, right? The other piece is stress. When you're fasting, your body's under stress and you can get a stress headache. You can get surges of cortisol that cause blood pressure to increase, putting pressure on the nerve endings in your brain. This can go away though, okay? It takes a little bit of adapting and your body getting used to lower levels of blood sugar. Uh, hypoglycemia headaches are throbbing and pulsatile. So if you start getting that womp, 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 then you might need to start breaking your fast a little bit earlier until your body adapts, okay? The next side effect is bloating. Now this is a strong one after you break your fast, okay? Because when you're fasting, we all love it because there's no bloating. We don't feel any distension, discomfort. We just feel good. Most of the things that happen with fasting, we just feel great. But when you eat, then all of a sudden they rear their ugly heads. Okay, so what happens is we have pretty significant mucosal atrophy. So in our gut, we have a mucosal layer that protects it. And when we fast, that breaks down because the gut goes through sort of a cleanup process where it regenerates everything. So that means the short window of time between when you end your fast and you actually eat, your gut is actually at its weakest. So you need to gingerly introduce food, not literally with ginger, but gingerly. You need to delicately introduce food. So you wanna decrease the intake of dairy, things that are gonna cause inflammation right when you break your fast. You wanna avoid cruciferous vegetables because those can be hard on the gut. So avoid broccoli, cauliflower right when you break your fast. Okay, anything that's gonna be inflammatory. So no wheat, no gluten, nothing like that. Also reduce what are called FODMAP foods. So nothing fermented, no kimchi, no sauerkraut, especially things like that. That can really cause a lot of havoc and it will make a big difference. So you wanna start with just some easy protein. That's usually the best way. Just lean protein, not a lot of fat. Let your body break it down. Let the mucosal layer come back. Let your gut biome sort of reset. And then an hour later, eat your other foods. So when you are trying to choose the right foods to break your fast with, you can have the lean proteins. There are some things that you can add into the mix. It's complicated and there's a lot of moving pieces. So I've gone ahead and I've created a Thrive box. So Thrive is an online grocery store. You probably see them in my videos all the time, but I wanted to make it easy for people. So I created literally a keto box, a fasting box where I was able to go to Thrive and say, hey, these are the groceries that I would recommend for this given diet protocol and I put them in a box, and that way it's open to the public for them to get Thomas DeLauer's Keto Box, Thomas DeLauer's Fasting Box, and I'm always changing the ingredients based on research and stuff like that. So Thrive, 
online grocery store so you don't have to go to the grocery store anymore. You can literally click, get a few things, have them shipped right to your doorstep, and never have to leave the house. But then you also get me kind of assisting you with your shopping by assembling what I think are the best items at that time for fasting, for keto, for thyroid, you name it. Anyhow, so check them out in the description after you watch this video. You don't want to miss that, so check them out. The next one, and this is a big one, I know a lot of people deal with this, you're getting freezing cold during your fast. Okay, other than putting a blanket on, I don't know if I have a solution for you, but I do have a reason for what's going on and it might make you excited, it might make you embrace being cold a little bit more. It means you're burning fat. Now this is somewhat of a theory, but it does connect when you start looking at a lot of just the genetics and things like that. We have a pretty interesting thing that happens when we are fasting. We have an upregulation of what's called the MIR149 gene, okay? This, so here's what's happening. We have brown fat and white fat. Brown fat is like our visceral fat, but brown fat is the fat that is derived from muscle tissue, and it keeps our metabolism going. Brown fat is an okay fat. Brown fat makes it so that we, our metabolism is elevated. White fat is the unsightly fat that has no purpose other than being insulative, right? It's just, it insulates us. So what happens when we're fasting is we have a migration of white fat turning to brown fat because the body is in a period of time where it's trying to upregulate the metabolism to keep us warm. But in doing so, we actually get colder because we have a migration of white fat to brown fat. So basically, in theory, what's going on, all the blood is rushing to that brown fat to create energy, to keep us alive and keep us going. So consequently, the blood is coming away from the other tissues, away from the muscle and into that brown fat, mobilizing blood there, mobilizing that fat and getting us to burn it. So when we get cold, it's brown fat really kind of doing its job and just getting utilized for fuel because it's gonna go from white fat to brown fat to burned. Does that make sense? So one thing I wanna make very clear is it's not a metabolic slowdown. It's not your metabolism slowing down at all. It's actually quite the opposite. It's your metabolism speeding up. You're not getting cold because your metabolism is slowing down. The next side effect, number four, is gonna be sleeplessness. Okay, so if you are Intermittent fasting, where you're doing a 16-hour fasting period, an eight-hour eating window, you may not experience this quite as much, but if you're doing longer-term fasts uh, overnight and things like that, you definitely will experience some of the sleeplessness. Two very simple explanations for this, and honestly, nothing to be alarmed at. One is adrenaline. When you're fasting, your body's under stress. Simple, your body's stressed. So if your body thinks you're under stress, it's not gonna let you sleep because you don't wanna get attacked by a tiger or a lion or a bear or a walrus. But if you wanna end up being like, just successful with your fast, you kind of need to accept that. The other piece is orexin. Okay, orexin is a neurotransmitter that's associated with wakefulness and it upregulates when we don't eat. When we do eat, orexin ends up going down and that's kind of why we get tired after we eat a big meal. Orexin plays a big role in it. Now, studies have shown that mice that are having lower levels of orexin tend to be more obese. So high levels of orexin, although associated with sleeplessness, are also associated with being leaner. The interesting thing is, is that orexin makes you feel wakeful. So you end up feeling good even if you slept less. So it's all kind of a balance. We actually don't need as much sleep when we're fasting because we have so much restorative effect going on anyway. We don't need as much sleep, that's the benefit. So even if you feel like you only got four hours of sleep, you'll probably feel like, wow, I slept pretty darn good. So you don't need to stress about it. You're not fasting forever. You might have a couple days of cruddy sleep, but honestly, you're gonna function just fine and it's all good. Okay, the next thing that I need to talk about is kind of a fun one. Okay, this side effect is kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing, but you're gonna lose some weight and you'll probably maintain your muscle. Okay, the Journal of Translational Medicine published a study, looked, took a look at 34 resistance trained men. Pretty interesting stuff. Okay, for eight weeks, divided them into two groups, had one group consume meals at 8 a.m., 12 p.m., and 8 p.m. The other group consumed the exact same amount of calories at 1 p.m., 4 p.m., and 8 p.m. So same amount of food, same everything, except one group ate only in the afternoon and evening, the other group ate all day, okay? Just split up evenly. But guess what? They all maintained the same amount of muscle. They didn't lose muscle, neither group, okay? They were on a controlled diet. However, the fasting group lost 16% fat, whereas the other group lost 2.8% fat. So yeah, okay, the point is, is that it's a freakish thing, and it probably has to do with IGF. So you've seen with studies, that IGF, which is responsible for localized muscle growth, doesn't really diminish with calorie restriction. So we still have the IGF and the growth hormone working in our favor to preserve muscle. So the reason I put it as a side effect is because it is kind of a side effect. Most people would say when you're on caloric restriction or anything like that, that you have all these negative things and blah, blah, blah. This is like kind of a fluke. 
Intermittent fasting is very unique in that sense. I also wanted to just throw something positive in there because here I am peppering you with negative stuff. It's all good, positive stuff. The last one is a really fun one. And that's a side effect of people thinking you're weird. Okay, you can't get around that. Okay, there's that kind of in-out theory. And that in-out theory is where from sort of a survival mechanism, if someone is an outlier and doing something different from a survival standpoint, that person probably isn't a safe person to be around because they're doing something different and they're not going to be good for the, the sake of the village or the tribe. Okay, so it's kind of this psychological thing we've developed. It's not biological, it's psychological. That feeds into biological. We are in a different world now where we have our own means to survive and excel. And if you want to be different, you have less competition. So that's the way that you do things. Is you go in a world where you don't have to swim with the sea of people that are just believing whatever they want to believe. You can go and you can be the outlier and you can be the strange one. Let people think you're weird. They're going to think that you're weird all the way to the bank. But they're going to think that you're weird all the way to you getting in the best shape of your life. So you do what works for you. It is probably the biggest side effect but everyone focuses just on the body and the physiology. The psychological just sort of alienation that comes with intermittent fasting is a very tough thing to deal with. And I'm here to tell you that if you stick with it, you can have success. All the rest is just random physiological stuff that you can deal with and you have answers to. So as always, please keep it locked in here on my channel. And if you haven't already, please do check out Thrive Market down below in the description, just so you can do us all a favor and also help support this channel. I will see you soon.